during the pandemic, digital payments have really grown in leaps and bounds. So for people who are not in the industry, how much more seamless can it get? Like, what's the vision that you pitch to prospective investors and users? Maybe we'll start with uh, Tessa, of course, our homegrown um, uh, app from uh, Sendit, born and raised in Indonesia. Yeah, really great question. If we're talking about um, uh, digital payments in the region, I think actually it's still extremely fragmented. There are many different players, right? Private sector, tech companies, uh, tech companies like Newman or Wallex um, who play in the consumer pay, uh, space. There are players like Zendit who are playing in more of the B2B space. There are your um, traditional players like banks who are definitely moving into the digital space in a really rapid uh, rap rapid pace, as well as um, actually the central banks. If you look at Southeast Asia, what's a little bit more interesting is that the central bank actually plays a big, big role in um, regionalization of payments, right? They're building um, standardized QR codes across the region. They're trying to build a lot of the switcher networks internally um, within the markets, right? Um, so I think right now, it's still very fragmented. There's still no clear winner. And actually, when it comes to interoperability, I don't think it's quite there yet. We have quite a few years to go. Um, maybe just to add to that, right? I think payments is not created equal. At least that's how we see the world. So if you ask me as a consumer in Singapore wanting to do domestic payments, it's absolutely seamless. I don't think any of us here would say that it's not seamless. But I, as a traveler who just landed in Jakarta last evening, wanting to buy a SIM card, having to go and figure out where do I get rupiah, to be able to pay across the counter, I'd say it's not seamless, right? So there's a fragment, um, there's an entire spectrum of how you would think of seamlessness. If you're thinking of it from a domestic consumer perspective, payments have become seamless across Southeast Asia specifically. But on the other end of the spectrum, the moment you get into B2B cross-border complexities, I'd say the friction still exists uh, on when do I get the money? How do I be compliant and do cross-border remittances? Uh, there is very limited transparency in how much the recipient will get. And those are the kind of challenges that we at NIAM are trying to solve for uh, creating the infrastructure that links the payment systems across these regions. Yeah, so uh, I guess I can also uh, add to the, to the points here. I feel like, um, you know, in uh, ASEAN countries, so different countries, they take like a different approach and there are so many participants. In this, uh, in this area because the pain points is so obvious. I would say like, you know, in the past decade, a lot of the focus is really about the consumer experience. So no matter like, you know, which country you are traveling to in ASEAN region now, I believe like, you know, the consumer experience are more or less become like, you know, better, especially for those domestic residents, right? But you know, for foreign travelers, it can still be quite a pain. And uh, um, if you look like, you know, consumer experience look that, uh, like that, when you look at, look at like, you know, business payments experience, it can be even worse because the uh, interoperability and also the uh, connectivity within, uh, within the region, you know, across different countries, they still have like, you know, different standards, different rules of working. And to consolidate like, you know, so many things isn't really an easy job. It's going to like, you know, to be like a you know, joint efforts across the ecosystem. So good point there. And the ASEAN summit is happening across the street now. One of the biggest priority areas for the region is that cross-border uh, interconnectivity and reducing that friction that you guys mentioned. Um, I wonder, Kai, you, uh, Air Wallex has been expanding not just in Asia, but also US and Europe. Um, how important is that regulatory push in setting that uh, foundation for uh, cross-border payments? Do you see it as a complement to how you operate? And how do you deal with the competition once that regulatory framework is there? Yeah, I would say like, you know, the, um, the regulatory push <clears throat> and also the uh, <clears throat> inter-country kind of uh, cooperation is very essential to really push like, you know, the uh, connectivity or the seamless use experience, especially for the business payments. Because uh, Airworks is uh, like a you know, laser focus on serving like in the business, on serving the merchants, no matter if it is like you know, B2C or B2B merchants. Um, so here, like you know, using uh, Europe as an example, right? So we know like you know, Europe has a clearing system like you know, SEPA. And uh, with that, and also like you know, uh, kind of Euro as a single currency in multiple kind of countries in Europe, 
actually, of course, like the payments become much easier because you have a single rule of declaring. You know, like, you know, what is the standard messaging system look like? And uh, if you look at, like, you know, ASEAN, like, you know, I know, um, and also, like, you know, the business nature in ASEAN is a bit similar to Europe because a lot of those business is, like, you know, uh, natively, like, you know, cross-border, right? You cannot imagine a merchant, like, you know, just very much focus on like, you know, local business, especially for those online merchants. They are like, you know, they want cross-border, they want like, you know, global. So how to help those merchants to expand globally? While like, you know, in ASEAN countries, you might be able to count like, you know, a hundred like you know, local payment masters, if not even more. And also you have so many kind of a banking systems to integrate. And then you also have like, you know, so many kind of a, a card schemes in the, in the region. So our wallet is helping, like you know, connecting those dots in, like you know, helping them. So for example, um, um, there are a very uh, typical use case where we see, like you know, those uh, small businesses they need to pay out to different countries in ASEAN. So those are typically, like you know, small value, but like you know, high frequency payouts. And this is something that you know, not really facilitated by the traditional banking system because the cost of uh, processing those payments for banking is very, very high. And this is like you know, how FinTech work, right? And on the paying side, as another example, is like, as I said, like you know, so many kind of a different payment methods for you to connect. If you, if for like you know, a business, they need to connect those payment methods one by one, then you know, they just cannot really do the businesses. So this is like you know, how we can help and how like you know, we together can help with, uh, with the merchants. Yeah. So uh, maybe just to add to that, right? So I think um, when you think of interconnectivity, at least from an outside-in perspective, the way we think of it is it's improving the infrastructure as a whole. Uh, whenever you start reducing friction on payments infrastructure, you start seeing new use cases come up. Um, so day before yesterday, I sent less than $4 to a colleague here in Indonesia because we were pooling together to get a gift. Even six years back, that's not a possibility that we could think of. I would have to go to the bank, do a $4 transaction, send a wire cross border. The fees itself would have made that transaction um, unsustainable. Would have been more right? than $4. Exactly. I would not have been able to do that. Um, so I think as the, it's, it's amazing to see the infrastructure start to be laid out by governments, them realizing that this needs to be solved for. We'll start seeing more and more use cases increase. We'll start seeing more and more B2B, B2C cross-border flows happening because that friction has come down. And as a result of which, we'll see the expansion of the uh, global economy around cross-border payments. So that's how it helps complement uh, the business that all of us are here in and ensuring that cross-border payments go through seamlessly. And then the second aspect of this is also the fact that as you start layering out these infrastructures, as you start thinking of what happens next, that's where we're at the vanguard of defining the new use cases, right? So think of fintechs as the accelerants, as the catalysts for what are the use cases that we can help make possible. To Kai's point, uh, an e-commerce merchant for a very long time would have just gone live with cards on checkout and was expecting to do amazing business in Southeast Asia and in Latin America, et cetera but very quickly realizes that, hey, I need PICS in Brazil, I need UPI in India, I need some of these local payment methods in Southeast Asia. And without those, I don't have a multi-country e-commerce business, right? And so um, those are the kind of payment challenges that Vietnam are solving for and saying, hey, this is where the world needs to get to. This is where our clients are asking us to be. So we act as the accelerant and then the bank, the legacy infrastructure, the government start thinking of those use cases from a more secular perspective and then saying, how do we build these connectivities in? So um, we definitely see it as a big enabler for our business. We definitely see this increasing the pie that we have to play in. Yeah, I think for me, I see um, this sort of opening up across border payments uh, by governments as an accelerant um, that, or a catalyst that we can all use so that for me as a consumer, tomorrow, actually yeah. some of had a very similar um, experience when I went to Bangkok. I am Indonesian through and through. I really wanted to eat some durian. <laughs> so I went to a durian stall and I was like, great, cross-border QR code is already available. So I tried to open up every app that I had. I tried to scan this QR code, didn't work. 
finally had to like actually borrow money from the taxi driver, which is pretty <laughs> embarrassing, and then find a friend to pay him later. Um, but but it kind of just shows, right, that that interconnectivity. It can't just be the government. It can't just be some private sector. Payments is extremely complex. There are a lot of layers, a lot of players as well in the ecosystem, and they all have to play ball for things to actually happen so that me, Tessa, if I want a durian, durian, I can just scan QR code and get the durian and eat it, right? Um, and, and, and that is something that will take, I think, a few more years to work on. But I think um, what the five governments, I think right now, right, um, of um, Southeast Asia who are, who are committed to building this new infrastructure of QR code, I think is a really fantastic start. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier something that I think Southeast Asia has a lot of very similar qualities across markets, but when you go down to the individual countries, they're very, very different. Um, you're now in Indonesia and Philippines looking to expand across Malaysia and uh, a few other countries that I will let you disclose. Um, but how do you bridge those different levels of readiness across MSMEs and even retail users? Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, um, not all Southeast Asia is the same, right? I think. Um, people who are looking from the outside in and go, you know, for example, investors will be like, go to Southeast Asia, um, just fix Southeast Asian payments. It's not quite so easy, right? Indonesia, in Indonesia, I think um, money in, we've kind of solved that. Um, you know, a lot of people are using QR code now, right? I mean, you can get to a Bluebird. If you're Indonesian, you can scan your QR code, make a payment really easily. If you go somewhere like Philippines, maybe that's less of a payment method, right? but you can go to a pawn shop and make a payment, which to an Indonesian is mind blowing. So not all of Southeast Asia is the same. And um, so to be able to get to a point where a merchant can actually accept payments, to get to a point where a Kaira or Samat can make a payment when visiting the Philippines, I think will take a lot more people um, to work together. And that, what that means is it's about standardization, right? It's about then opening up for interoperability as well. And it's about um, not just governments, but private sector also working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and also to Tessa's point, I mean like, um, especially when you look the current economy, I mean the big backdrop is the inflation in kind of a era, right? And we all know like you know, all those central bank is like you know, fighting towards it. And uh, with bear that inflation in mind, actually everything becomes more and more expensive. And uh, it's the same applying to like, you know, those micro SMEs especially, because they don't really have a, a lot of bargaining power against their supply chain, against their consumer. So as a kind of a, uh, you know, FinTech player and the solving the global payments, what we are trying to do or really, really focus now is about like you know, lowering or reducing the total cost of ownership for the merchants. Because like, you know, in this inflation kind of a, um, Era, I would say, like, you know, this becomes even more important because if for like, you know, those cross-border payments, you still need to add like, you know, three, four, or five percent of the uh, transaction cost, then you know it will pass on to the consumer, and then the price become totally unacceptable. Especially like, you know, for if you look at like the economy here, a lot of those kind of GDP per capita isn't like, you know, as high as like, you know, we can see in Europe or or the U.S. Like. We still very much focus on like you know, how can we produce and also then deliver, you know, a very kind of a cost-effective and acceptable goods to our consumers. So I guess like you know this is uh, somewhere that we are also trying to push forward now, and uh, we are thinking this like you know not only on an infrastructure level but also on a software level. So now we are also trying to building like you know the expense management, uh, the bill pay. And also the invoicing connectivity with like you know NetSuite, Zero, those kind of financial softwares, so that you know the total cost ownership of both softwares and infrastructure can be reduced to minimum by by the efforts. I think um, from our perspective, right, I, I'll take two different uh, points here. I think one is what are we seeing in Southeast Asia, right? So we serve everyone from e-commerce merchants to FIs in the region. And one of the things that we're very um, interestingly seeing is that a lot of the traditional legacy FIs, right, and payment service providers are starting to realize the importance of the consumer experience on importance of speed of cross-border payments or the cost of cross-border payments. And they're willing to work with fintechs and partners like ourselves. So 
the top four banks in Thailand use us for their cross-border retail remittances, right? And we are parting their entire retail proposition to their consumers because they very quickly realize that the legacy infrastructure just does not deliver to the consumer SME expectations there. Um, on the other hand, though, I think it's also very interesting. Um, we have offices across the world. We're fairly large in the US, our headquarters in the SF. If you think of contrasting those two merchant bases or client bases, it's actually phenomenal. In Southeast Asia, payments need to happen in seconds. In the US, if it happens in a day and two days, they're like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that works for us, right? Like, so I, I think it, it's also a matter of how we've grown up with payments in Southeast Asia and are so used to speed of payments being an important part of uh, our expectation. Whereas in US, maybe those expectations are more get towards how good is your technology? How seamlessly can I integrate your APIs? What's your cost of total transaction, right? So I think those are two really interesting sides of seeing how um, the end client or customer expectations changes, not just by region, but also um, the use case you're solving for. Um, one of the primary concerns when we talk about payments in Southeast Asia has always been safety. How do you make sure payments go by fast, low cost, but are not compromised in terms of risk? And this is a poll we'd like to open to the audience if you can scan your QR. We wanted to gauge just like the general comfort level of uh, people in terms of like the cybersecurity of Southeast Asian payment systems. And while we're waiting for um, our audience members to respond, um, I wanted to ask you, Samar, um, when you speak to your clients, how do you bridge that trust gap when they raise safety concerns? It's very interesting. So clients obviously trust us with their money. We're doing $25 billion of annualized volume. Um, we don't take that trust lightly. It's a very important privilege uh, for us at Neom. And the way that we've done it, especially in the B2B space, um, is that it essentially boils down to three things that we try and solve for our clients, right, in the B2B payment space. One is consistency and repeatability. If you're able to give the client the same experience day in and day out, right, if they come and do a transaction from Singapore to do a payout across their entire workforce in, let's say, multiple countries, and they repeat that and we give them that same consistent experience, that builds trust, right? Um, second is transparency on if a payment does go wrong or if there's a, a failure in a payment, how much information can you give the B2B merchant or the client on saying what happened wrong on this specific payment and how can you correct it to re-initiate that payment? That also adds trust. Um, but Probably most importantly, we work very closely with regulators, right? So we work with the MAS. Uh, in fact, we're one of the few fintechs that has direct connectivity into Fast and PayNow. We continue working with regulators all over the world to help understand what are the use cases today, what are the trends today, uh, as well as what are the trends that we believe will become very important in the near future and the risks that come with it, how can we help solve for them? Um, a very interesting example is um, we've started driving a fair bit of cross-border payouts for payroll companies, right? So companies that help you solve for payments to gig economy workers and others across multiple regions. And imagine we are helping them disperse salaries into the end recipient's bank accounts. We cannot be late in doing that. It's a critical payment that needs to happen. I can also not say, I don't know how much will the recipient will get, right? We need to be guaranteeing how much money the recipient will get. The moment you're able to deliver on these two promises, uh, there's a lot of trust that comes with it. Um, obviously, it's taken us nine years to build this trust. It's not easy. You can't build it overnight. I wish I could say that it was um, some easy way of building this trust. There isn't, right? You have to go through all of the licenses you need to build, you need to build the right infrastructure, you need to have the right um, uh, people in the right seats to be able to deliver on this trust. I think our first few results are coming in fairly, um, nearly half neutral in terms of like the cybersecurity of payment systems, one third confident. Um, are you happy with those results uh, or room for improvement? Definitely a lot of room for improvement. I, I, I think uh, I'm actually very surprised because in Indonesia, I know e-wallets is a very um, well-used form of payments, right? And despite that, um, seeing people not being as confident in using digital payments, 
is very interesting. And um, I wish I had comments here to understand what's driving that little bit of hesitancy in not using digital payments to better understand uh, what are the reasons why uh, the audience doesn't trust using digital payment systems. Look, I mean, from a Zenit perspective, right, we are a B2B player, so we help a lot of enterprise um, accept funds and send funds. Um, so we have that luxury of looking at patterns, not just for one business, but for multiple businesses across Indonesia and now increasingly Southeast Asia. And I'm not surprised by these numbers because in Indonesia alone, for example, most of payments are still done either by bank transfer or QR code, which are all push. Mm -hmm. What this indicates is most of us are not comfortable to do things like input card numbers, even if we have a debit card, and to let somebody pull the payments from your account or from your card, right? Most people are still going, I'm going to take control of payments. I'm going to actually scan the QR code, and I'm going to say, yes, I will make this payment. And that, I think, actually reflects that most people are not confident in digital payment systems. Um, so I think, to me, these numbers make sense. But if you think about it, players like Neum, Zendit, AirWallex, obviously, as digital payment players, security is utmost for us. Right? We, we pride ourselves in speed and also in security of payments. And if you look at Southeast Asia, most of fraud does not occur by people breaking into our systems. Most of it is, I say, I, I'm stealing this from somebody else in a different uh, panel. What he said was most fraud occurs because people tell a good story. Most fraud occurs because of social engineering. It's not because someone's breaking into your bank account, right? Most fraud is occurring because I'm going, hey, um, I've got a really great deal for you. You give me $100, and I'm going to sell you this car for $10,000 instead of $50,000, maybe a Ferrari for $10,000. And people are like, awesome, I'm going to do it. And that, that has nothing to do with any amount of tech. All of that is more to do with education about financial literacy. And that, I think, is actually the bigger problem in Southeast Asia rather than cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And also, um, to Tessa's point, right, so here, if we look at the number, I, 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 if you look at that from the angle, like, you know, net promoter score, it is uh, really not very uh, positive. I guess, like, you know, it also has a lot to do with, like, you know, um, kind of the uh, history of the existence of the uh, digital payment in the, in, the, in the region and also across the countries in uh, ASEAN. Um, f using an example, like, you know, PayPal, right? So at day one, when it was it's established about like you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't like you know, at, at the scale of uh, you know, current status. It also built the trust like, you know, with the consumers and also with the merchants bit by bit. So I would say, like, you know, first of all, it uh, does take time. So we need a bit more patience. And the second of all is like, um, in current environment, I mean, there are a lot of uh, kind of unexpected situations happen not only just to digital payments, but even to banks. If we remember, like, you know, just four or five months ago, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, right? It's a bank of, like, you know, more than 100 billion assets. And, uh, you know, it just to kind of a encounter an a solvency issue, like, you know, overnight. So um, I, I can understand, like, you know, at current environment, why, like, you know, the consumers and also the businesses has to be a, a bit more kind of a cautious about like on the payment masses, about like on you know, the uh, financial partners they are working with, because like you know nowadays we do see like you know a lot of uh, unexpected situations. And last but not least, it's about also the service layer of uh, like you know I would say like a lot of uh, digital payment now. Still like you know we see like you know we call it a thin layer, not the fat layer. Still a lot of digital payment, uh, no matter it's a wallet or like you know gateway, they are still doing like you know process payments. But when it goes to like, you know, cash management, when it goes to like, you know, real like, you know, lending uh, facilities for, or loan facilities for the merchants, it has done like, you know, fairly smart job here. So it, it is also about like, you know, when we further expand our service layer, of course, like you know, under the regulation to those fat layers, then, you know, we can also gain kind of more trust from the users. Uh, looking ahead, You've, we see the tech sector being hit by job cuts, more limited financing, uh, and consolidation among different players. Um, how do you see this affecting your push towards more interconnected cross-border payments in the future? 
Yeah, uh, um, maybe I start first. I would say, uh, looking ahead the future, I still think like you know there are going to be three themes called, uh, across like you know, the cross border payment and also the interconnectivity of the payment. So I think the cost is still the rule of the sun. So and it is uh, such a pain point now. And uh, I guess like you know, we also have a plenty of examples like you know for U.S. merchants versus uh, Southeast Asian merchants, where like you know U.S. merchants have more tolerance about like you know the speed but they actually in, enjoy much lower cost compared to Southeast Asian merchants. So the cost I still think like, you know, it will become like, you know, one of the driving force for that, no matter for like you know, the consolidation of the players or like, you know, for the new innovation, I guess a lot of things is going to be centered around the total cost of ownership. And the second is really about like you know, the security and the reliability. I expect like, you know, no matter from the regulators or from like, you know, the partners, we are going to be more and more focused on the reliability of a lot of uh, digital payment players here. And uh, the last kind of uh, driving forces that I, can, that I can see is really about ecosystem play. So in a current industry or in a current environment, it doesn't make sense like, you know, for, we to, for us to build another kind of a PayPal or to build another end financial. More and more we see like, you know, those kind of a, a FinTech players in different kind of value chain steps can work together and also across those banking partners, regulators, local payment masters, card schemes, so that you know we build the interconnectivity as a joint effort rather than like you know we are just trying to you know cover all those upstreams and downstreams. Maybe I'll go next. Um, so I think in, in this kind of new world, it's actually I think it's a really good development for startups to be a little bit more disciplined, right? I recall a, a, a year or two back. Uh, most startups uh, want to be the super app. We want to do anything and everything ourselves. There's no point in working together. We're just going to take over the world. In this new world where we have to be a bit more conscious about where we put our money, um, I think it's great because we can focus on the things that we're good at. We can focus on solving actual customer problems and we can be a lot more disciplined about it. And for everything else, we can then get together with other startups, with other players in the ecosystem, and work together towards the same goal. So I see this as a good development. It will weed out the stronger startups who are actually solving problems that customers um, need to uh, are asking us to solve, rather than um, startups who are you know just throwing money at trying to get market share without really a clear idea of what exactly do customers want because they're buying customers, right? So I think overall it's really healthy. Um, I think. Um, in terms of cross-border payments for um, startups, it's still a very healthy landscape and a lot of good opportunities. And Samar, to add? I think we find this as an opportunity to continue to build, right? So we are actually just inaugurated an incubator in Singapore called Bolt, where to Tessa's point, we're taking fintechs and startups who have identified a problem, who have identified, hey, here's our business model, and helping them with the mentorship and guidance to really make uh, the most of uh, a period like this. So 100% agreed that this is a period at which you put your head down, you focus, and you build on what your core capabilities are. 